So, uh, yeah, so hello again. Uh, so welcome to this 88th uh, webinar of uh, W2S, what we call as a webinar series on uh, Spintronics. Uh, it's really start really going um, nice because of speakers like uh, Joao and many others who are also here uh, who are giving talks in this uh, uh, webinar series. I'm really grateful to all of you and thank you very much, Joao, for accepting our kind invitation and agreeing to okay. give this talk. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining all of us uh, for this 88th uh, webinar. Um, on behalf of my W2S team, uh, Braj, Puspendra, Ajar, Sakti, uh, Swayam, and many others, I'd like to thank all of you, in particular Joao for today's talk, and all of you for joining all these webinars and encouraging us to continue this activity. Uh, so Joao is, I think, very well known in the field of Spintronics, but still I like to tell a few words and maybe some young students who may not know him. Uh, Joao has uh, obtained his PhD degree from Imperial College London in 2011 under the supervision of uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Russell Coburn, uh, where he has worked on logic devices based on moving domain walls in permaloid circuits. Then he moved to France at uh, CNRS Thales. I think he worked with uh, Professor uh, Hansel Cross and uh, Nobel Prize winner Professor Albert Furt for some time and did fantastic work uh, on the topic of movement of domain walls in magnetic neuron junctions driven by spin currents and how they can be used to build memory stores. And there he started actually studying magnetic skirmions where his nature communication paper is very, very well known to the community where he proposed that magnetic scorpions could be used to make information devices. In 2014, he moved to uh, Laboratory for Solids, that's known as LPS in Orsay, uh, as a permanent member. And there he uh, has been working on the dynamics of domain walls and scorpions in perimenters. Uh, that's the topic of today's lecture. And I'm really happy, Joe, again, to express uh, that uh, you are giving a talk today. It was kind of planned a few months back, but someone didn't work out. Uh, so I'm really looking for a lecture. Uh, just a few announcements that during the lecture, we don't take questions. So if you have any questions, then kindly write in the chat box or raise hand. And at the end of the lecture, we will uh, take all those questions. Uh, but just before the question answer session, I would request all of you to switch on your video and I would request Joao to stop the screen sharing so that we can take a you know, screenshot of the group photo, and then we can take the question answer. So with this, now I think uh, all yours, Joao, I'm really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vankar, for the introduction. Um, so as Vankar said, I'm, uh, I'm from DLPS near Paris. This is a picture of our lab. And the work I'm presenting today is the, the work of our team, and uh, in particular, the slides change. In particular, of um, of uh, two PhD students and one postdoc. So Leo Berges, which is doing his. P Can you see my mouse? Uh, uh, yes, my pointer. Yes, yes, you may use a ledger pointer. That would be better. Ah, but um, not sure. I know how to do that. So if you can see my mouse. Yeah, you uh, can right little... click. You can right click. No. Well. But I think if uh, okay, it will be okay, okay. continue. It's okay. We can see. It. So Leo Berges is uh, who's doing uh, his PhD with um, with us uh, at the moment. Uh, El Elwa Haltz, which is in this meeting, that finished his PhD uh, two years ago, and uh, three years ago, and Sachin Krishna, which was with us during a post his postdoc. And uh, these are the three uh, well people that did the main of the results. Uh, but it's also a, a, the effort of a team that you have here, the other members. So this talk, I'll start by explaining why we're interested in rare earth transition metal ferromagnetic alloys. Um, I'll give a very brief um, introduction on, on the theory of how this, the magnetization inside these alloys move. It's going to be very brief. And then I'll show you how we make and measure our samples and how they look like. And then I'll go uh, through uh, four studies that we've done uh, using these, uh, these uh, ferromagnetic uh, samples. Let me start. 
So rare earths transition metal ferromagnetic magnetic alloys are composed of uh, rare earth iron, like candelinium, terbium, dysprosium, and some uh, transition metal um, uh, like uh, cobalt, iron, or some mix of the two. Um, it so happens that it's uh, uh, the magnetization of these two elements uh, couple in an antiparallel way, and they're very strongly coupled. So you make a ferry magnet. You have, uh, for example, in this schematic, you have the red uh, arrows, which represent, for example, the gondolinium, and the smaller blue arrows, which represent the cobalt. The net magnetization of the material, you see, is going to be um, the difference of the magnetization from the blue arrows with the cobalt uh, with the gondolinium magnetization, which is the red arrows. So you get a system that has a very low net magnetization MS, but it still is very well ordered. So the spins are all um, ordered inside the system. And it makes that, this, that you have a very large uh, magneto-optical signals. You have very large uh, transport signals that you can use to measure the magnetic state of your system. Now, what's very interesting in this family of uh, alloys is that you can change the net magnetization by uh, changing the temperature of your material. This is why, because as you heat up your material, the magnetization of, uh, is going to be smaller, both for cobalt and gadolinium. But uh, it so happens that gadolinium, the magnet its magnetization is going to decrease faster than the magnetization of the cobalt. That's because they have a different, um, they have a different magnetic nature. And so if you, have the, if you see this calculation here in the, in the graph on the left, you have the magnetization versus temperature. In blue, it's going to be the magnetization of the cobalt uh, population, and in red, the magnetization of the gandolinium population. And so if you see at low temperatures, you'll see that the gandolinium uh, magnetization is bigger than the cobalt, but at higher temperatures, it's the opposite. And there's this point in the middle called the magnetic, um, the, uh, magnetic compensation temperature, where both magnetizations compensate and you have no net magnetization. So the net magnetization is the green line on the bottom. There's another special temperature, which is the, not the magnetic compensation temperature, but the angular compensation temperature, where it's not the magnetizations that are balanced, but the angular momentum of the system. And this is at a different temperature from the magnetic uh, compensation. And these two te temperatures are very important because one, uh, in one, you suppress the Zeeman interactions with external fields, and in the other, you suppress the magnetic precession, which depends on the angle of momentum. So you can change this by changing the temperature, as I show in this plot, but you can also change this by, by changing the amount of cobalt and gadolinium, and gadolinium that you put in the alloy, because it's an amorphous alloy with no precise uh, composition. And this is the small animation. And so as you enrich your, um, your alloy in gondolinium, you can see that the temperatures, the compensation temperatures shift, will be at a different temperature. And so you can choose by choosing the percentage of gondolinium where your compensation temperatures will be inside the film. So this material is very interesting uh, for uh, lots, of, um, lots of reasons. Uh, for us, in terms of physics, the main one is that it's a multi-lattice material, so it's an antiparallel lattice material, like an antiferral magnet, but it's one that you can easily measure because it has large magneto-optical effects and large uh, transport effects. An antiferral magnet, on the other hand, can be quite hard to measure because both sub-lattices have the same nature, and so it's very hard to distinguish them. Because the two sub-lattices are strongly coupled, the, the, you can reach very high frequency uh, dynamics. For applications, spintronics, which deals with how to use magnetic materials to, um, to, um, to build devices, uh, these materials have uh, interest for two things. One is uh, you have magnetic order with very little MS. So it means that they have very small stray fields. So for example, in a device where you want to store information with magnetic domains, this means that you can make them smaller and, and more tightly packed without fearing for interactions. And because you can also control the angular momentum density, the LS, the angular momentum density, you can control magnetic precession. So this means that you can build faster switching MRAMs. You can uh, prevent other effects that come from magnetic precession, like the deflection of skirmins moving uh, and uh, the velocity of, of uh, domain walls. 
So uh, this is the only theory slide I'll present. It's a brief, um, it's a how to think, how to calculate how, uh, the dynamics of these materials. So if you consider a very small uh, volume of, uh, of the Fermi magnet, you can represent the magnetization of one sublattice by one vector and of the other sublattice by another vector. And you could calculate how these move and how do these, um, how do you, these two populations um, um, interact, but you can also be a bit lazy and say that uh, the coupling is so strong that the cobalt and the gadolinium will always be anti-parallel. And so we'll, you'll only look at one single vector, which is uh, which you'll call the magnetization vector M. And, uh, and then you can try to use what you know from ferromagnets. You can try to apply the equation that describes the dynamics of ferromagnets, which is the landau lifshitz uh, gilbert equation. Uh, uh, which I uh, show here. So it looks complicated for if it's the first time you're looking at it, but it's quite simple. So on the left hand, you have the time derivative of the vector that represents the magnetization. And on the, uh, on the right hand, you have two terms. The first one is the precession. So you see it's M magnetization cross uh, uh, field that you might apply. And this describes the fact that magnetization precesses around an applied field. And then you have another uh, term, which is perpendicular to the first one. So it's M cross the first term, so it's perpendicular, which describes the fact that magnetization slowly relaxes towards an applied field. So uh, here, um, HF, it can be an, a field that you apply from the exterior, but can also be any energy of the system. You can, uh, for example, if you have an anisotropy on your system, you can uh, describe the, you, uh, an effective field that acts like that anisotropy by using this equation. So the derivative of the energy uh, in regards to the, to the orientation of your magnetization uh, divided by the total uh, net magnetization. You see that you have only two parameters, this green one, which is a gamma, the geromagnetic uh, ratio, which tells you the rate of precession. And another one, the alpha, which is the Gilbert damping uh, parameter, which describes the damping. Now, um, people have done this uh, quite a long time ago to study uh, fMR of ferry magnets. And we know how to calculate these parameters for our ferry magnets if we know the values for the cobalt and the gadolinium uh, ions inside of our material. So you see that net magnetization is the difference of magnetizations. The net angular momentum is the difference of uh, angular momentum. That's because the two spins are anti-parallel. The, the geromagnetic ratio by definition is the ratio of magnetization to angular momentum, so ms over ls. So now you know how to calculate gamma for a ferry magnet. The um, Gilbert damping factor is a bit um, more complicated, but it's uh, the same principle. You can calculate, you know, the power dissipation, you can measure it of your system, which we call here L alpha. This will be in watts per, uh, per rate of change of magnetization square. And the power dissipation of your of the ferry magnet composed of two sublattices is the sum of the power dissipations of the cobalt and the gadolinium. And the alpha is this power dissipation factor, L alpha divided by the angular uh, momentum density. As I showed you before, we can calculate how the magnetization changes with temperature. So this is magnetization versus temperature in red for the cobalt ions in blue for the gadolinium. We see here the uh, total magnetization, which is zero at the uh, magnetic compensation. We can calculate the same for the angular momentum density. Here is a green line. The power dissipation uh, parameter will say it's the same. And with this, we can calculate gamma and alpha. And what you see, you see, you start to see problems because uh, the general magnetic ratio is sometimes zero and or infinity, whether it's magnetic compensation or angular compensation as well as the Gilbert damping um, parameter alpha. And what this makes is that you, if you try to use this equation near the angle of compensation, you'll see that uh, you'll get lots of problems like infinity divided by infinity or zero times infinity. And you cannot use this equation so near uh, the angular compensation or the magnetic compensation. So the way to solve this is to replace gamma and alpha by these definitions above and rewrite this equation. That's what we've done here. So it's the same equation with the same two um, terms of precession and damping, but now you've avoided all the infinity divided by infinity problems. 
and you can read it much more easily. So for example, that you can see that the precession rate is LS, so it's uh, immediately proportional to the angular momentum density. And so you see that you'll have no magnetic precession at this temperature, the angle compensation temperature. And you can see that uh, even if alpha, the Gilbert uh, damping parameter diverges, if you actually look at the power dissipation, it's always, it's always there and it uh, doesn't diverge. It's always some values in finite value. And you know how to calculate these, um, uh, these terms which we describe the energy minima of the system. So what's missing here is what happens when you apply currents and current torques. Uh, this you can find in many papers, including ours, that we cite here. And so the message from this slide which, uh, is that this, uh, to use these ferromagnetic equations to describe a ferromagnet, you have to use effective parameters. And these parameters have some, uh, have some uh, strange aspects. For example, the magnetization can be negative. Uh, and then at TMC, at the magnetic compensation temperature, you have no Zeeman interactions. And at the angle compensation temperature, you have no magnetic precession. But otherwise, the, magnetic, the dynamical laws that you have for ferromagnets remain valid for the ferromagnet. So now I'll, I'll, I'll show you a bit how we make uh, our samples and our measurements. Um, the first the position process, then uh, I won't talk about how we make um, uh, the small uh, bars that we use to measure because that's the same for every other uh, thin film. And then I'll talk about the measurements, the, the optical and transport measurements. So this is uh, how do we make these alloy films? So we use a, a physical vapor deposition technique inside a chamber with a very good vacuum, so 10 minus 10 millibar. So that's to avoid all oxidation, all uh, impurities. And in this chamber, which is here in the picture, we have two evaporation uh, machines that we call here electron guns. You'll see why a bit later. And one of these evaporation uh, devices has a crucible with cobalt. Uh, we heat this crucible using an electron beam. Uh, it evaporates the cobalt and we have a quartz balance that measures the rate of um, deposition of cobalt. On the other, on the other uh, device, on the other side of the machine, we have the same for the gondolinium with a separate uh, quartz balance. Once we're happy and we adjust the current so that we have the, the rates of deposition for the percentage of the alloy that we want to make, we expose our sample and we can make thin films down to a few nanometers. In the end, we have to cap with aluminum or something else to prevent uh, oxidation because this is very uh, easily oxidized materials. Then we can measure it. And one way to very easily measure these devices is using uh, magneto-optical curve microscopy. And uh, these are, uh, this is uh, done with an optical microscope and it's based on the magneto-optical curve effect, which uh, I'll describe. It's uh, you sh uh, when you shine a uh, polarized light on a magnetic material, the reflected, uh, reflected light will have a different polarization state depending on the magnetization of the material. So if you use two, for example, two crossed polarizers, which we call a polarizer and an analyzer, you can actually uh, measure the, the magnetization uh, according to each position of the material. You do this in an optical microscope and you get an optical image. That's what I show here. So here, what you're seeing is a terbium ion alloy film. And you see the dark gray uh, areas are, it's where the magnetization is pointing down and the bright uh, areas are, it's where the magnetization is pointing up. And if you apply a film, you can see that one region in, uh, grows. So it's really a magnetic signal. Um, and you can then measure, for example, the domain wall velocity if you want to study that. The other, um, the other family of techniques we use is uh, transport, because it's a, a material that also has a very strong uh, anomalous hall effect. So how does this work? You have to make by lithography uh, hall bars. You apply a current, for example, in the horizontal arm, and you measure the voltage on the vertical arm. And now, due to the anomalous hall effect, you'll have a voltage, which is proportional to the magnetization of the cobalt sublattice. So for example, you can measure a, a hysteresis loop. So on the y-axis, you have the whole resistance and on the uh, x-axis, you have the applied field. And you, measure, you, can measure, uh, you can measure the state of the cobalt inside uh, during the hysteresis loop. And one thing that you 
very quickly uh, realized with these uh, systems is that if you change the temperature, you can switch the polarization, the sign of the of the um, hysteresis loop. And this you can understand if you if we start to imagine what's happening inside of the of the ferromagnetic material. So when you're when you're at a cold temperature below the magnetic compensation temperature and you apply a field, the rare earth, in this case the gendolinium, is going to be, it's going to have a bigger moment in the cobalt. So the system will want to align the gendolinium, the red arrow, with the external field. And so if you're at positive fields, for imagine, for example, 50 millitesla, you get a negative hall resistance. Now, if you heat up the system, you go from 270K to 280, and you cross the magnetization uh, compensation temperature, the bigger uh, magnetic moment will be the one of the cobalt. So now the state that the, the, it's the cobalt that aligns to the external field, and so it's pointing up and you get a, a positive uh, hole resistance at the same field. Uh, you can use this to measure the, the magnetic, temper, uh, magnetization, uh, magnetic compensation temperature. You can also look at the coercive, coercitivity of the hysteresis loop because it diverges at the magnetic compensation temperature. And so you get a more exact um, measurement. So um, now I'll show you um, the uh, one of the, the first studies we did with these materials. So in this study, I'll talk about how to uh, move the main walls by spin orbit torque. This is something that people found in ferromagnets about 10 years or 11 years ago. And it was a very exciting discovery because we found that in bilayers of ferromagnets with heavy metals, for example, cobalt platinum, we could drive the main walls very efficiently. So with a very small current, the main walls would move very fast. And we found out that this is due to the fact that when you apply current, the current, you have a charged current on the heavy metals, so on this case on the platinum. And because you have a very strong spin orbit coupling in this heavy metal, the diffusion of the electrons depends on their spin. And it so happens that the spins that are pointing in the direction transverse to the current will accumulate near the interface of the ferromagnet in a direction, polarizing the direction that we will call sigma. These spins will diffuse into the ferromagnet. There they will relax towards the local magnetization and this will apply a torque. And the torque is perpendicular to both the magnetization and the uh, direction of the spins, sigma, sigma cross m. If you have a nail domain wall, a nail domain wall is a domain wall like I represented here. So if you have an up domain, the, the magnetization of the domain wall of the nail domain wall will be perpendicular to the surface of the domain wall. Uh, it so happens that the domain wall moves very fast. Now, nail domain walls, usually you're not expecting them in thin films, but when you have an uh, interaction called jelonjinsky mori interaction, uh, you do, you find nail domain walls. And we were very lucky because the cobalt platinum interface uh, induces a very strong DMI on cobalt. So um, by using the same material, platinum, you can have a very strong uh, spin current due to the spin hole effect. And you have the DMI to stabilize the nail domain walls that you can drive with that spin current. Now, the thing with this uh, rare earth transition metal alloy is that you have a very uh, heavy uh, iron inside of your material, the, kind of the rare earth. And so you might, you might have some spin hole effect uh, by the current inside of the ferromagnet. So we wanted to see if um, in these materials, you can also produce a torque uh, by the spin hole effect, not on some adjacent layer, but inside of the ferromagnetic itself. And this is what I'll show you here. So to do that, we made our whole cross and we measure the spin orbit torques using a transport technique. Um, this, is a, this is a very well-established technique. So you apply uh, AC current um, and you measure the voltage. You'll have an AC voltage. And as I've shown you before, uh, if, uh, the, AC, the AC voltage is proportional to the magnetization inside of your film, the orientation. And so if you don't apply any field, you can have a positive hole resistance or a negative hole resistance. Now, if you apply a field in plane, you'll start to tilt the magnetization towards the plane. And so you see this kind of uh, history loop. You see a, a maximum signal. And as you increase the field, the magnetization tilts and goes to zero. Now, this is 
if um, this is the effect of the applied field. Now, your current might exert some torques on the, on the magnetization. And because it's an AC current, it will make the magnetization oscillate at the same frequency. So it will, the magnetization oscillation will make the resistance oscillate as well. And so you'll get a voltage signal that is at twice the frequency. And if you use your lock-in to measure this uh, double frequency signal, and you have some current-induced torques, you'll have some signals uh, with this weird shape that I show here. If you don't have any torques, this uh, V2 omega, so the signal at 2 omega, should be zero. And by using some mathematics to compare the effects of field with the effects of the current, you can deduce the effective fields or the, the strength of the or spin uh, induced uh, torques. Um, it's very easy to do near the zero fields for small applied fields. You can, you can check out this article. But because we had such small signals, we had to fit the whole uh, two omega signal that I'll show in the next slide. So this is the results from our uh, gondolini ion cobalt film. Uh, on the first plot, you have the, v, uh, the first uh, harmonic signal. So this is basically the, describing the magnetization pointing out of the plane and slowly being tilted towards the plane by the applied field. And here you have the two omega signal. And the first thing you see is it, uh, it, that it's that it's not zero. So it means that you have a uh, torque that it was induced by the current. If you do it in the other direction, you measure the other direction of the torque. And you also see that you have a torque, you can you have a current induced torque also in that direction. Now to, to try to understand where these torques come from, um, our idea was to change the temperature because that's something that, uh, that you can learn a lot from uh, in these materials. And here the, the plot shows the strength of this, of this, um, of this uh, current induced torque versus the temperature around the co uh, magnetic compensation temperature. Uh, and what we see is that the strength diverges at, um, at around the magnetization compensation temperature, which is exactly what you uh, expect for that spin orbit torque that I shown you before. It's supposed to, um, the effective field is supposed to vary with one over DMS. Um, and so if you calculate this uh, theta SHE, which is called the spin hole angle, it quantifies the strength of the spin hole effect. You see it's more or less uh, constant across temperature. In the other direction, it's the same thing. You also find a divergence, so something that varies with one over MS. So you can know that it's a spin orbit, um, that's a torque induced by the current through the spin orbit effect. Um, there's lots of, um, there's a few um, phenomena that can give you, uh, that can produce this torque. Uh, here we assume it's a rush uh, uh, effect mechanism. And so we can also calculate a bit like for the spin hole angle, uh, a rush efficiency factor, which is constant uh, for temperature. Now we have a torque, but it's quite small. Um, as I told you before, to move domain walls, you need two things. You need a torque and you also need the domain walls to be of the nail type. And so we wanted to, sorry, we wanted to know if we have that chalonzhinsky mori interaction that stabilizes um, uh, nail domain walls. To measure jalonzhinsky mori we use a magneto-optical technique, uh, Bruon light scattering. I'll show you how that happens. So you have your material here. Uh, you shine a, la a laser light onto your uh, system. And uh, um, it might so happen that your photon interacts with a spin wave that is inside of your material and uh, gives it some energy. And so this is an in inelastic scattering event. So if you analyze then the, sp the spectrum of the backscattered um, diffused light, you can find uh, whether this has happened. So this is what is shown here on the plot. So uh, what's called frequency here is frequency difference. So how much the backscattered light frequency change in relation to the original frequency of the laser light. And you see that you have a peak at, uh, at the lower frequency, in this case, minus uh, seven gigahertz. That was due to this transfer of energy between your laser light and your uh, spin wave or magnet inside of a material. The other, the opposite thing can happen. Your, your photon can interact with a spin wave and 
uh, the spin wave can transfer some energy to the photon. In that case, you'll have a scattering event where the scattered photon has a higher frequency than the initial light. And you have the, what's called an anti-Stokes process, or uh, for the first one, the Stokes process. Now, it so happens that if you choose well the geometry of this measurement, uh, the one of the process will be with spin waves that are favored by Jelinski Moria, and the other process, the anti Stokes, for example, will be uh, with spin waves that are uh, unfavored by DMI, by the Jelinski Moria interaction. So the energies of the two spin waves will be slightly different, and so the frequencies of the Stokes and anti Stokes will be slightly different. And so it means that if you calculate the difference, you can uh, get the Jelinski Moria parameter D. And this is what we have done. So this is something which is also proportional to the to the vector um, to the wave vector of the spin wave that we can change. So this is not the wave vector of the light; it's of the spin wave. And the slope uh, gives you the effective um, effective um, uh, DMI. So we found that we also have an effective DMI in this film without platinum. Uh, it's small; it's much smaller than in the platinum cobalt uh, system that we're used to, but uh, even though it's small, is it enough to make narrow domain walls? Now, the problem with trying to know that is that domain walls are very thin, so you don't see them um, uh, in your microscope. We had to go to a, a synchrotron to use a much higher um, um, resolution technique called XMCD PIM that I'll explain in this slide. So, in this technique, you have your, um, you have your uh, ferromagnetic layer. You shine some X rays. The X rays will uh, make some photo emitted uh, electrons that you can use a microscope to image. So, this is the PIM part of the problem. Now, to get some magnetic contrast, you use uh, X rays that are uh, circular polarized in one way or the other. And you, you make one image in one uh, uh, polarization and the other, and you see the difference. And this is what's called XMCD, uh, X ray magneto circular lacrys. And by, this, uh, by looking at this, you can find out whether you have magnetization uh, along or anti-parallel to your X-ray direction. So before going to the synchrotron, we calculated what signal we were expecting in a, for a thin domain wall. And that's what I show here in the plot. So if you have a block domain wall, the magnetization is going to be uh, along the domain wall and you shine the X-rays perpendicular to the domain wall, you get a signal that is in the center, uh, described by the central line, you have a transition. However, if you have a nail domain wall, you have lots of magnetization that is parallel to the X-rays, so you'll have a peak of, uh, of signal, of XMCD signal. If you have a nail domain wall oriented in the other direction, you'll have, a, instead of a peak, you have a dip. So that's the third uh, curve. And this you can you can actually measure even if your uh, resolution is much worse than the domain wall width. So, um, so this is a good technique to find out if you have nailed domain walls. And here are the images. So the blue arrow is the X-ray direction, and you find that you have some uh, domain walls that are perpendicular to the X-rays. So that's what we'll analyze. And you see on the left that you have a, um, a small dip. In the intensity, so it means that you have a nail domain wall in with the, the, the direction that is uh, in this schematic. Um, when you go from an up to down domain, now if you look at the other transition from a down to an up domain, you see that instead of a dip, you have a peak. So it means that the magnetization inside of the nail domain wall is opposite, and we found that this is consistent throughout the sample. So it means that our nail domain walls are always chiral. So it means that they always follow the same rotation. Uh, for example, down, right, up, or up, left, down. So, uh, and moreover, this chirality, so this uh, sense of rotation, is in agreement with the sign of the, of the, of the DMI that we measured with the Brillouin light scattering. So, uh, we, were, we were very satisfied, but it's still kind of mysterious how you can have um, now domain walls when the, our DMI is 1,000 times smaller than the DMI of platinum cobalt. To understand this, we have to look a bit more of, uh, on what decides whether you have a block or an L domain wall. So block domain walls are domain walls that, are, uh, that uh, decrease the dipolar energy 
that is quantified by ms square and now domain walls are domain walls that uh, that decree satisfy the jalousy schemoria interaction so the, uh, that is uh, quantified by the parameter d so there's a threshold uh, dmi you have to have a dmi bigger than this threshold uh, if you if you expect to have an l domain walls and this threshold is given by this equation but you can the important thing is to see that it's proportional to ms squared so the square of the magnetization our, um, and that explains a bit why we have the old domain was because we have a system that we can have a very low MS. And you see that uh, the DMI that we measured was about eight microjoules per square meter, which is far uh, eight times, well, seven times bigger than the critical uh, threshold DMI. Also means that in these systems, you can expect to have nail domain walls within very, very low DMIs as long as you're close to the magnetic compensation temperature. So in, uh, in summary, we observed some spin orbit torques, we observed some DMI, we observed some chiral textures, and all these, um, these phenomena need two things, need a strong spin orbit coupling, but also a system that is asymmetric. And our system doesn't have any special interfaces. So it doesn't have any break of symmetry. And moreover, we think we're amorphous. So there's no crystalline um, symmetry to break the symmetry of the system. So to understand where uh, the symmetry comes from, we did some uh, TEM studies in cross-section. That's what I'm showing here. So this is a cut of our film uh, observed by STM. And you can see the film in bright, uh, in bright construct contrast that confirms that it's an amorphous layer with very flat interfaces, so nothing special there. But we get a bit more information if we use a technique called EELS, energy, uh, electron energy loss um, spectroscopy, that tells us where the different elements are uh, inside of our, uh, of our very magnetic layer. And here we see that it's not homogeneous at all. It has a profile in thickness that is consistent throughout the sample, and that breaks the symmetry of the system. And so this is quite an interesting mechanism because it's independent of interfaces. So um, you could think that you could now put platinum on top and you'll get the DMI from this gradient plus the DMI from the platinum. So we go for the, uh, we'll go for the next study that we've performed, which uh, where we study the domain walls move by spin of the torque. Um, let me describe a bit, a bit first what happens in ferromagnets. So in ferromagnets, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the schematic that I, that I talked before. You have a platinum layer that uh, induces spin current. Um, you have an L domain wall. As you increase the current, you increase the velocity because you have more spin current, more torque. But soon you start to see that uh, the increase in velocity is each time smaller. So the velocity seems to saturate. And this, um, you can understand if you if you study what's the uh, state of the of the domain wall. So a static domain wall is an L domain wall in this system. But however, when you push it, when it moves, due to magnetic precession, magnetization inside of the domain wall will will move, will shift, will tilt, and will transform uh, into uh, not a block wall but something that is closer to a block wall. So this is quantified by the angle of magnetization phi. And this angle is, uh, as you can see, is proportional to the applied current and to the, to the angular momentum density, so to the magnetic precession of the system. Now, I told you that this, is, this um, driving mechanism is good for nail domain walls, but doesn't work for block domain walls. And this is quantified by this equation here. So the velocity is proportional to the cosine of this angle. So it's zero when it's block and it's uh, one when it's nail. Now, the interesting thing the interesting thing for us here is that this, we can suppress this mechanism because in a ferry magnet, we can uh, set the, the LS to zero at the angular momentum compensation temperature. So this is uh, this, what the simulation shows here. Um, so the different colors are different temperatures. The X uh, axis is the current and the uh, velocity is here. And you see that for every temperature, you observe the same thing as for ferromagnets, so uh, saturating velocity, except that, that the purple temperature, which is the angular compensation temperature, where you see that the velocity is uh, steadily increasing and the phi angle is zero. 
This is uh, in simulations and uh, analytical models. However, in practice, this is kind of hard to measure because you don't really know where TAC, where the angular compensation temperature is. And phi is really hard to measure in a, in a static domain wall, as we saw in the PME images. It's even harder if the domain wall is moving. So um, I'll show you how we, uh, how we got around these problems. So we built, we built, we uh, deposited this film, a uh, linear iron cobalt with platinum. We apply currents, cur uh, very short pulses so that we don't overheat the system. And we see that every time we apply a pulse, the domain wall moves. So we have this spin orbit torque um, uh, propagation mechanism. And now what we want to know is the state of the magnetization inside of the moving domain wall, because that's, um, um, that's what we want to know. And our idea on how to probe this was to apply, uh, at the same time as we move the domain wall, a field that is transverse to the track. And now there's two things that change the phi angle. There's the magnetic precession, and there's this uh, HY uh, external field. And, uh, and so this both will change the phi angle, both will change the velocity, and the velocity is something that we can measure with the magneto-optical images. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let me show you the results. So here you have velocity um, in green when we apply a negative field, in black when we apply no field, and in uh, pink when we apply a positive field, versus the temperature uh, for the same current density. And so this is the experiment. This is the model. And you see it matches very well, so we were uh, happy. And let's see if we, under, we can understand it. And below, I also show the difference in velocity between applying a positive field and a negative, but it's the same data. So to understand this, it's easier to start with, uh, with, uh, with the magnetic compensation temperature. So at this point, uh, there's some angular momentum. So the magnetization is tilted while it's moving. Um, you, but because you have no magnetization when you apply a field, nothing really happens. There's no Zeeman energy. So whether you apply a field or not, you get the same velocity. And that's the first zero that you find here. Um, it's very different at the angular compensation uh, uh, temperature. Here, the, we expect not to, have, not to have any precession. So the, the domain wall should be narrow. And so uh, when you apply a positive field or a negative field, you're actually uh, increasing the absolute value of uh, phi. So you're decreasing the cosine of phi. So the maximum, uh, the bigger velocity should be when you apply no field at all. And it should be the same whether you apply a positive or a negative field. And that's what happens in the green arrow here. Um, and so with this, with these measurements, by analyzing these measurements, you can, uh, which are, um, you can find uh, two things. You can find that you do have uh, precession-free dynamics at, at a certain temperature, that is the angular compensation temperature. Now, this was for domain walls. Let's, uh, let's look now at what happens for uh, skirmians. So um, for uh, skirmians, I think, uh, well, they're uh, well known, but uh, I'll explain a bit what they are. They're these, um, they're these uh, magnetic textures that uh, you can think of existing in a uniformly, uh, for now, uniformly magnetized film uh, along the blue uh, direction down. And the skirmian will be an island of up magnetization that is divided uh, between, uh, that is divided to the blue direction by continuously varying magnetization. So you see it's a smooth texture. There's no abrupt changes. And if you have a system where uh, you have these kind of textures and the, the um, chirality, so the way they, they change from blue to uh, you see down, uh, right, up, left, down, it's always the same. You have, uh, you can say you have skirmish because all these textures have the same chirality. So uh, their size depends on lots of things, but one of the parameters that, uh, that varies their size is the um, dipolar interaction. So the, uh, the magnetization saturation. And, and the lower the dipolar, the smaller the skirmish you expect. So this is interesting. It means in ferry magnets, you expect very small skirmians when you have very low MS. Um, when you push them, they have this interesting uh, property that if you push them in one direction, 
rightwards here, they will deflect uh, laterally. This is called topological deflection. It's due to magnetic precession. So it's uh, proportional to the magnetic uh, angular compensation, uh, the magnetic um, the angular uh, momentum density, LS. And so again, it's very interesting in ferromagnets magnets because we can choose the angular compensation temperature. So LS will be zero. So you should not have at that temperature, you should not have any um, uh, topological deflection. Um, so we can be um, we can be confident that this is that this description is uh, actually works. There's some uh, there's this work by the Beach Group uh, by Careta in 2018 where they observed very tiny uh, skirmings, uh, 20 nanometers big, in a ferromagnetic alloy. For the deflection. Um, this is not really a skirmian, but you can, you can think of it like a half skirmian. And here they measure the deflection, so the propagation of this domain, depending on the temperature. And they do observe this is temperature where the domain expands without deflection. So this uh, seems to work. We wanted to test in our own ferry magnets. So we uh, made a film with the appropriate uh, parameters to stabilize these kind of textures. This is a galenium cobalt film with a platinum um, underlayer. We see that for most temperatures, so this is the hysteresis loop versus field for uh, measured optically for different temperatures. And you see that you go from a saturated state, for example, on the red curve to, to uh, the opposite saturated state. However, in some temperatures, for example, the black one, you have some intermediate states. You have a non-remanence uh, of the hysteresis loop. And if you look at the magneto-optical images, you find that in these regions you have lots of domains and in some conditions these domains are form uh, tiny bubbles that look like scrambians. Um, and this is exactly where you expect them to be because if you measure the magnetization and the anisotropy of this film you can calculate a uh, characteristic length that tells you the size of, uh, of the, the domains stabilized by the polar interactions which is this LC parameter which is the ratio of domain wall energy to dipolar energy, which is ms squared. Um, and you expect these domains to be stable when this characteristic length is about comparable to the thickness of your film, in this case, five nanometers. And you can calculate for different temperatures based on, this, uh, on these measurements. And you find that at 290K, you have a very small characteristic length. At 320K, you have a very large one uh, compared to the, uh, the uh, film thickness. And around 300 Kelvin, you have something which is comparable to the, to the uh, film thickness. And this is exactly where we find um, our experiments. So this is a very rough analysis. You can calculate this much better if, uh, uh, as described here in, this, uh, in these um, references. Uh, but the important message, message is that in this system, you have experiments that are stable in some range of temperature and field. And the main stability mechanism is uh, polar interactions. So uh, let me show you what happens when you apply currents. Uh, the current will nucleate skirmians and move them. And I show here two videos for two different uh, fil uh, fields. And I hope you can see that the skirmians move. So the current is from left to right. And you can see that the skirmians move with a very large, um, or the bubbles move with a very large deflection angle because we have a deflection, a topological deflection. We can conclude that, and it's the same for all the bubbles. We can conclude that we indeed we have skirmings. Um, But as you see, we have lots and lots of uh, skirmings. So uh, to be able to study them, we used a, a semi-automatic, a semi-automated skirming measurement and tracking system. So uh, the next results I show were was measured for thousands of skirmings, where we measured their shape and diameter, their velocity and deflection angle, and at different fields and temperatures. So let's look at what um, what we can learn from that. So here is first the first observation: How does their size change with the applied magnetic field? And it's not so surprising when you apply a magnetic field that is. Uh, parallel to the magnetization in the center, you increase their size, and when you apply ma uh, magnetic field on the opposite direction, they become smaller. To measure, you see that the diameters that I show here are on the limit of the optical resolution. So we, we checked if our algorithms to measure their diameter do work with a higher resolution technique, uh, magneto, uh, magnetic force microscopy, and they do work. 
Um, next, I'll show you uh, what we can see that there's also some hysteresis that's due to pinning. There's some pinning in the system, so the, the size of the scrubbing shows some hysteresis. But when we apply current, actually, the, their size is in between. So the current makes them uh, reach their stability um, size. So here I, here I show the velocity versus current density for a certain uh, field. So this is for uh, screaming that are about 800 nanometers uh, big. And what you see in the small crosses are individual skirmians. So you see there's lots of dis uh, dispersion, but on the line and circles, it's the mean. Because we measured so many skirmians, the mean is actually not uh, so noisy. So we can uh, learn something from it. And the first thing you can see is that at low current density, the skirmians are pinned and, not, and don't move. Then there's a very well-defined deepening uh, threshold. And then they move in a linear regime that extrapolates to zero and reach very fast velocities. So we were very happy because it's uh, very rare to see uh, deep in skirmings, so skirmings that are moving in uh, this linear regime. Uh, we could also measure its deflection angle. Deflection angle has a much larger dispersion, but you can see that it's more or less, it looks more or less constant at minus 40 degrees, 45. Uh, if we change the field, we change their size. And this is what we get for, uh, for um, the smaller skirmians. And what we see is that as the skirmian gets smaller, it's, uh, it goes slower. So the mobility increases with the size of the skirmian. We, we can use the same kind of uh, models that we did for the domain walls, it's these effective models. And uh, those models tell us that the velocity should be linear with current as we observe, and should depend also on, um, on this factor uh, rho. And this factor depends on the skirmian diameter. So the bigger the diameter, the smaller the rho, and the larger the velocity, and that's what we seem to observe. Now, we were um, the nice thing about these, um, these model predictions here in the dashed lines is that we plot them almost without any fitting parameters. So we measured every parameter inside of the, that is needed for the model using other uh, measurements. And the only thing that is left is the strength of the spin hole effect uh, theta, so the spin hole angle. Um, it works less well for the deflection angle because we think we have such a big um, dispersion that we we're not allowed to we're not uh, able to distinguish um, different deflection angles. So, uh, yeah, we have fast skirmians in this unpinned regime for the first time. Uh, we observe that their velocity changes with their diameter, and moreover, the deflection angle that we observe is is uh, the one that is. Uh, that we calculate from the uh, angular momentum density of the ferromagnetic film. So now, so all these results were res uh, are uh, studies where this effective model of, uh, uh, of the ferry magnet works. Now I wanted to show you a study where this doesn't work, where we are not uh, able to describe it with this effective uh, magnetization. And, and that is, um, uh, spin waves in uh, some geometries. So to study spin waves, we use the brilliant light scattering um, uh, technique that I explained before. And as before, for ferromagnets or for ferry magnets, you expect a pair of peaks for the Stokes and anti-Stokes process. Um, however, if you think that your approximation of a perfect anti-parallel alignment is not true anymore, you can have some, uh, you have another degree of freedom, which is the angle between the magnetizations. And this should produce two extra um, peaks, so a new pair of peaks uh, on your BLS spectrum at higher frequency. And if you measure, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a gadolinium iron cobalt film with no platinum. You, you do indeed observe uh, the two, well, the two, let's call them ferromagnetic peaks and two extra peaks at higher frequency that are uh, created by this extra degree of freedom. Um, so because it's a ferromagnet, we'll do what we do every time, which is to change the temperature and to observe what happens to these peaks. Um, so you see, as you cross the different compensation temperatures, the peak positions and amplitudes and uh, widths change. And if you uh, 
measure their frequencies and you plot them versus temperature, you get something like this. We have four modes, uh, always a Stokes or an anti-Stokes, and then we classify them in high frequency or low frequency modes. And now we'll look at what happens near the angular compensation temperature. You see uh, here the, the four modes around the angular compensation temperature TAC, and let's compare to what's the prediction of this of the effective model. So if you take the effective model that we have been using so far, we expect the frequency versus something, the x-axis you can think of it as temperature. But around the angular compensation temperature, it should have a, a double lobed peak with a zero in the middle. And this is nothing like the observations. So you see none of the four modes uh, follow this curve. Now already for um, ferromagnetic resonance back in the 50s when people developed these models, um, they knew about this high frequency mode. And so there's this uh, high frequency approximation by uh, Kaplan Kittel that tells you that there should be an extra mode uh, that follows these uh, red lines. So near the angular compensation uh, temperature, it should uh, lower to zero. And again, at the angular compensation temperature, you don't think you don't see anything uh, like this um, mode. So this means that you're actually you actually have to go back, uh, forget about the ferromagnetic model, and go back and solve the double landau lifshitz gilbert uh, system for the both sublattices, and you actually have to find out what's the energies for both sublattices for all the anisotropies, uh, what's the strength of the coupling, etc. Even if it is, is much more uh, much more complicated, uh, you can extract some analytical models, and so this is what uh, I show here. So below, you see the top panels are the BLS measurements, and the bottom panels are the spectra calculated using using the LLG um, equations, and you see a very good match. Um, and for the central frequencies. The points are the measurement data that I showed you before, and the lines are the frequencies from the model. So you see that you have a very good agreement. So this means um, that if you have a very good agreement and you have a quantitative description, it means that you were able to, um, to find out what are the energies of your system uh, for the cobalt and the gadolinium lattices independently. So it's, uh, it's, BLS is also a very powerful technique to study these ferry magnets in more detail. So in summary, because I think I'm a bit long already, um, what I showed you is, this, is that uh, this class of systems, the ferry magnetic uh, transition, rare earth transition metal alloys are very interesting for fundamental studies and for applications because they have these two um, special points, the magnetic compensation where you have no Zeeman interactions and the uh, angular momentum compensation or you have no magnetic precession. So this means that uh, if you have no magnetic precession, you can avoid all the problems that come with precession, which is the or problems or uh, phenomena, which is the skirming deflection or the domain wall um, precession driven by um, spin orbit torques. And that you can still use um, spin wave spectroscopy to, uh, uh, to find out what are the properties of your ferromagnetic alloy. So um, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'll leave you with the pictures of, of the people that did the work. So Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joe, for this excellent talk. On behalf of thank everyone, you. I'm uh, really clapping for your excellent summary of many things, actually. Uh, we will take a photo now, so I will request you to stop sharing. And I will request everyone to turn on their camera. Let's have a group photo as a souvenir, and then uh, we'll come back to the questions. It's uh, great. Uh, Albert is there. Hello, Albert. Very nice to see you after some time. Hi, Albert. Thank you so much for joining. OK, guys, please turn on your camera. Just please uh, be a few seconds. Smile. OK. 
Okay. Uh, Svanka, for the okay. questions, should I share the screen again? Yes, now you can share the screen and uh, uh, I think I have taken already the photos. Thank you so much for your kind cooperation. So uh, if you have questions, uh, please raise hand or uh, write in the chat box in case you want me to read. I already see some questions. Uh, so he says that he could, uh, Pradeep, uh, he could not follow the attack transition. Could you please explain it again? What do you mean by here about no magnetic precision at this temperature? I think the beginning in the introductions you talked about it, yeah. Yes, so uh, usually with the, with the magnetic system, uh, you only need to talk about uh, magnetization, so the MS. And this, um, this is basically the strength of the Zeeman interaction in your material. So how, how strongly does it couple to external field? Um, however, if you want to look at the dynamics, you have, to, you have to enter into account with another parameter, which is the gyromagnetic ratio. Because actually the way it moves, it's not directly uh, connected to the magnetization, it's connected to the angular momentum. And uh, if you only look at uh, cobalt or iron, it is basically the same on the gyromagnetic ratio changes very little. But if you go to ions that have, uh, for example, very large um, uh, orbital uh, momentum, the gyromagnetic ratio, the gamma, is very different. And so this is what happens in these ferry magnets. You have, um, if you have uh, terbium cobalt, for example, they have very different uh, gamma values. Cobalt and gadolinium, they're very, they're closer together. But so that's why the angular compensation temperature, the magnetic compensation temperature, are close together, but uh, but they're still different. So, what does this mean? It means that at the point where where both the rare earth and the um, transition metal have the same magnetic momentum, same MS, they do not have the same angular momentum. So your system, even though it has no magnetization, it still precesses because what precesses is the angular momentum. Um, now what you can do, you can heat up a bit more so that what is uh, balanced, it's not the magnetization, it's the angular momentum, which is MS divided by gamma. And uh, in gadolinium uh, cobalt, you find it's always a bit uh, like 40 Kelvin uh, higher. Uh, but for other ferromagnetic materials, this difference can be much, much bigger. I hope this is uh, this answers your question. Yeah, I think uh, yes, thank you. And the second uh, question, uh, the second question is. You are, I will, uh, maybe before we take the second question, I have a question. Uh, because that is more to the SOT. Uh, so in the preparation, actually, when you make this uh, co-deposition and you make the alloy. So oh. um, how do you make sure that it is in the ferrimagnetic uh, composition? I mean, because you have some finite uh, magnetization. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do you really make sure that this is the ideal composition to be in the ferrimagnetic range? So um... Actually, it's, uh, it can be a quite a hard problem because um, what I didn't tell you here is that when you evaporate very thin films, uh, you can have some of, for example, some of the gadolinium that uh, diffuses to other layers that you have on the, on the side. So um, it's, it can be quite hard to get a film with the composition that you want. The best way to find out what you did is to uh, evaporate or to deposit not one film, but you deposit uh, 10. And then you measure each one of them versus temperature. And you measure where are the compensation temperatures. And, and this you can do for, uh, in different ways. You can, you can apply a field and see uh, which, which domains grow with a positive field. You can, uh, you can use the transport measurement versus temperature like, uh, like it's done here. Uh, and this way you can find out what the, um, magnetic compensation temperature for the film that you evaporated. If you want uh, one that is, has a slightly higher, um, higher compensation temperature, you go back to the position and you increase a bit more the, the position rate of the gadolinium and you have uh, something which is uh, higher. So, and also if we want to check exactly what we have, we have evaporated, if we don't trust our parts balances that much, we did also some root, root effort uh, backscattering 
that's when you um, that um, allows you to quantify how many uh, gadolinium ions you have in your film and how many cobalt ions you have, and then you can check if the if your process uh, works the way you think it works. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was actually asking more from the magnetic point of view that okay, you said that you can do all these measurements and. Uh, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, there can be a little confusion between simple ferromagnetism and ferrimagnetism because both have some net magnetic movement. And uh, so, uh, because you have cobalt in the composition, so how do I know that uh, when you make the... Uh, I, think, I think the clearest way to be sure is to observe things like, uh, like for example, the change of sign of the hysteresis loop okay. of, the, of the anomalous Hall effect or of the magneto-optical effect. Because okay. it's something that you can only have when you have a ferry magnet. Okay. So if you lower the magnetization, you can have a higher passivity that you can always have in a ferro magnet. However, to change the sign of the hysteresis loop, it means that you change the balance. Uh, you can only have it in a ferry magnet. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Uh, I think there is a related question from Chandrasekhar Murapaka. Chandra wants to know how about coarse pottery? So you, I think you can do it. Uh, so we don't do it in our lab because we don't have a sputtering machine, yeah. but, um, but there's people that do it. Actually, you can do uh, this kind of uh, systems. You can have, uh, you can play around a lot. Can, there's people that do, for example, not uh, uniform uh, film, but that do uh, cobalt thin layer, gadolinium thin layer, cobalt thin layer. So you can, you, it's kind of a big uh, playground that you can, that you can uh, do different systems and still have this, um, these properties. Okay, uh, there is a question from uh, John Carlos. Uh, please, John. I don't see him. Uh, John, could you kindly unmute un and ask the question? He raised hand. I'm not sure if it was accidental or what to speak. Okay, uh, Professor Anjan Varma, please go ahead. Hi. Um... This is Anjan Barman. I, I have a quick question about the Brillo light scattering. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I see that you uh, mentioned somewhere that you measured the D value of eight microjoule per meter square. And that is very tiny. And uh, I was just wondering that uh, what is the corresponding, you know, sort of delta F uh, for that? It should be extremely small, right? Uh, it's here. It's. Um... It's uh, one gigahertz at uh, 14 uh, inverse about, micrometers. Yeah, so, oh uh, yeah, point 0.5. So let me see. So it means that you have to do, um, yeah. uh, you, have to, you have to have quite high signals. And we were lucky that these materials have a very big uh, magneto-optical effect. So you, you have uh, quite a big uh, signal. So it's not no, that I, long to take this spectrum. I understand that. My question is that what is the resolution, frequency resolution of your setup? It depends. Your... It's limited by the noise. So um, if you're, um, and by the scan, um, the scan window. So in this, uh, this technique, you can, you can uh, adapt your um, spectrometer to, to uh, scan different intervals of frequency. So that uh, basically fixes you how many points and what's the width of the of the peaks, and um, the other limitation is how much signal you have. Because if you if you don't wait long enough, you have uh, very small peaks, and then you cannot measure very accurately their frequency. But you can see here. So uh, to, that's why we we measure different um, uh, vector uh, wave vectors, so that we can we don't have a single measurement. We have lots of measurements, and then we can be sure that we were not measuring some artifact, that it actually changes when we change the wave vector, and uh, we get the DMI by the slope, not just by dividing um, uh, one single point. Right, uh, just uh, some more clarification regarding this. So generally the analog uh, instrumental line width is about 300 megahertz uh, for all, like uh, from, uh, you know, some book the wavelength that you have and all this. And uh, the digital resolution is free spectral range divided by the number of multi-channel analyzer, if I remember correctly. So the, I think probably you are using the digital uh, resolution here. 
to resolve this so what what is i mean do can you tell me what is the what are the number of multi channel analyzers in your system or? Uh, no i guess it would be the number of points here but um the the frequency so there's a, there's a the resolution would be limited by the the peak width and that's uh, that's why here we scan only to 25 gigahertz for example um but I think the, the easiest way to be sure that you get that you, you're extracting a very good uh, central frequency is to look at how they change. And also, we've done quite a lot of work on the shape of the fitting functions so that we actually have a very accurate description of the, um, of the BLS peak that allows us to. Um, it's not just a, a Lorentz function, it's a actual good right. description of the shape. Mm -hmm. That allow, allows us to, um, to get a bit more precision on the central frequency of these peaks. So what, what kind of shape do you use? Is it a white function or? So it's described on, not this paper, the, the other one where I, where I described the models. Mm -hmm. So it's a asymmetric uh, Lorentzian function. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we, what we did to be sure that that was the shape of the function is that using that analytical model, we could calculate what's the shape that we expect for a perfect film. And that's uh, the asymmetric Lorentz is actually the shape of the perfect film. Of course, in experimental film, you'll, you'll have other mechanisms of, um, of uh, peak width. So it's, uh, it's not so simple, but, um, but at least you start out with a good shape. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I have one question uh, for the scorpion lasers. Uh, you showed uh, the scorpions are moving, and there is a little bit of uh, distort, uh, like uh, deflection due to the topological Hall effect. Is it so? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm wondering because in ferry magnets, the topological Hall effect should be very minimal, isn't it? And the angular compensation temperature, that's what I showed here. Okay. So the, um, when we set out to make this uh, experiment, uh, I won't lie to you, what we wanted to measure, it's uh, this point, it's straight uh, skirmish. However, that would not have been a very nice measurement because uh, if you don't have deflection, it's very hard to say that you have skirmions. So the perfect measurement would be to measure skirmions at different temperatures, one side and the other, and see how they deflect. So uh, what you plot here, this topological reflection basically from the images, yeah? Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry uh, the slide with the theory here. Okay, this is theory. This is theory, yes. Okay. okay. So this is the but angle versus temperature. So did, you, did you measure, let's like, say, simple uh, topological Hall effect by transport at different temperatures to see if uh, it is daily vanishing at that temperature? No, no. Okay. But this is, uh, so I call it topological deflection. It's, um, and sometimes people call it the Skirmin Hall effect. Yeah. But that can be a kind of a confusing way of calling it. So what I'm measuring here is when you move Skirmins, they get deviated sideways. Yeah. And that's what I call topological deflection. Okay. Or, and that some people call uh, the Skirmin Hall effect because it's, it looks kind of like what the electron does, but, um, it's this dynamical texture effect. So here it's, you can see it's very strong. You, the current is along the track. The track is this rectangle you see in the image. And the skirmions uh, are moving with a huge angle, with a very strong angle, so. Okay. Uh, maybe we can take one last question uh, from Pradeep about SOT. Uh, so in the SOT calculation from the two omega measurement, are the contributions from anomalous Norse effect or spin effect effect? Uh, have you taken that account? Yes, so, so I went very, uh, I didn't go into the details of those measurements. You can find um, the details on, in the article, of course. Uh, but yes, uh, one problem with these kind of transport measurements is that you have lots of effects that give you, that can give you uh, some signal and that you have to, that you have to rule out. So that, yes, we did consider for the an anomalous nurse effect and the spin effect effect. And okay. The other question I see is the absence of precession at um, the angle compensation stops the Walker breakdown. And the answer is yes. So at the angle, uh, the Walker breakdown is also due to magnetic precession. So at the angle compensation temperature, if you drive a domain wall with field, 
uh, you should not see any um, any um, Walker breakdown. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we are almost done with the questions. Uh, may I request you to stop sharing your screen? I like to share my screen and present a small uh, uh, token of appreciation from our group or from our team. So I, I will read it, uh, Joa, for you. Thank you so much for giving this excellent talk and being with us. The WTS seminar webinar series on screen tonics and ISA Goodness for India takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Joa Sampai from CNRS University Paris Saclay in France in recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on ferrimagnetic dynamics in gadolinium iron copper. Thank you so much, Joe, for this uh, excellent talk. I hope uh, you will join our other talks. Uh, Albert is actually one of our regular visitors for some weeks. Uh, he was uh, maybe busy, but he joins our talks and I hope I will see you also around and that would be very uh, nice. So thank you so much all. Have a good night or have a good thank day. Thank you for organizing it. And thank and, you for uh, listening. Yes, thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.